OK. So t your reading for today, we're back into Ableton after what seems like quite a bit of layoff just because of the fact that we had the Labor Day holiday, which knocked out a Monday, right? Um, so we did this kind of intensive boot camp. We spent a lot of time in Ableton. You got really familiar with it. And then I kind of we put it to the side, and we were looking at other environments, right? Uh, today, we're going to come back to Ableton. We're going to look at um, some more advanced techniques and uh, some connections with specific styles of music, okay? Um, as well as starting our unit to talk a little bit about modulation synthesis, which modulation synthesis will be the thread that connects today's class to Wednesday's class to Friday's class, particularly in the readings that you're going to do for those classes. So if you're looking ahead. So when I get to talking about modulation synthesis today in class, and you're like, what is he talking about? We didn't do, the reading wasn't specifically about this. Know that your reading for Wednesday and Friday are going to be about it, and we're going to see how those are, how this technique is implemented in Max and in hardware as well, okay? So um, it's kind of a presaging what's to come. So before we get into that, uh, just a reminder about the extra credit, right? Uh, I mentioned this on Friday, uh, offering you extra credit if you put together a, a watch party for the I Dream of Wires documentary. Uh, again, it, it must be a watch gathering, watch party. I mean, you don't have to have food and drinks and that sort of stuff, but it just needs to be more than one person, more than sitting down and watching it by yourself, okay? The idea is to give you, it, to encourage social interaction with your classmates outside of this 50 minutes a day that we do three times a week, okay? Uh, that's the point of the extra credit, okay? That's, that to me is valuable. That's why I'm willing to give you extra credit for it. The extra credit is three points. An, an unexcused absence is also three points. So if you do this, it can actually effectively cancel out an absence somewhere along the way, okay? So that's, I'll, I'll throw that back out to you as an option. Uh, and I told you on Friday how to document that. If you have a question about that, you can uh, talk to someone else who was here Friday, okay? Uh, the reading responses. Looking at your reading responses for today, um, it looks like we need to look at the random eternal trash uh, patch that was built in the chapter just to make sure we're uh, aware of the different components of that patch. Um, there also were a few people that are were confused about um, diatonic scales, okay, and that probably are people that are not uh, music majors, not in the music uh, theory sequence, okay. Those of you that have had two and three and four semesters of theory, what's a simple way to explain a diatonic scale to someone that's not familiar with that? A major scale. A major scale, right, okay. So a major scale, when we say... What? What else would you say? I mean, if someone, if you said major scale and they go, what does that mean? Within what? the key, or within the strict seven notes, does that apply to only one key? Okay. Any other? You can also describe it as a series of four and a half steps. That's the most common in Western traditional music. Okay. Is any of this helping those of you that were confused about what a diatonic scale is? Isis is shaking her head no. Okay, so uh, if I instead cite examples, right? Uh, how many of you know The Sound of Music? Okay, you hate that movie, but you do you know? Do you remember the song Do Re Mi Fa So La Ti Do? No. Okay. Okay. There's a whole song based around a major scale, and they sing the different notes of the major scale, basically, and that's the purpose of that song. Okay. Um, I don't know. Most. Music compositions are based on, in Western tradition, are based on the major scale. Uh, some are also based on the minor scale. Um, but uh, diatonic scale, typically when people are talking about a major scale. If you look at a piano and you play only the white keys, you're basically, uh, starting at the C, you're playing a major scale. Okay? Does that help start to ground things in your experience there? Okay. Um, we're not going to be specifically using a diatonic scale today. We're going to be using just some intervals. Uh, hopefully this will continue to come out as we play around with music even more. But uh, I don't know. Hopefully that gives you some grounding, some experiences, some things you can go look at. Um, even if you hate the sound of music, go find the Do Re Mi. I don't know. What's the official name of that song? Do A Deer. Is it called Do A Deer? Okay. I don't know. Google that later. Sound of music, Do A Deer. And listen to that song. They're basically singing through the major scale in that song, okay? Um, 
let's see. So my other question, I want to pull out some of the, there were some names, some historical references in the chapter, right? And, um, oh, and it, before I get to that, there are also some references to types of music, okay? Uh, minimalism, ambient, and generative. Ambient's the big one in this chapter, right? Because it's, it's the name of the chapter, right? We're talking about ambient style of music. Um, but these three terms, although they're used in relationship to each other, I want to make sure that everybody's clear. These are not synonyms, okay? Is that okay? Everybody, if I say not synonyms, everybody knows what I mean by that, okay? These are not the same thing, okay? Minimalism, minimalism is not the same thing as ambient, is not the same thing as generative. Now, you can have a generative ambient piece, but you can also have a generative dubstep piece, or right? There's a shout out to Daniel, right? Okay, uh, who's scared about that chapter coming up, right? You can have a generative rock piece. You can have a generative insert style name here, okay? Generative just has to do with the idea that you're using algorithms to generate the material rather than predetermining it, rather than putting in... Uh, um, figuring out the parameters yourself of what piece what piece of music goes to another. It's it's using objects like the random object to generate musical material. Okay, so it's the same that that verb generate is key to talking about generative music. Okay, um, minimalism. If I had to explain the difference between minimalism and ambient to somebody, uh, how would I do that? Christian. Minimalism is like. A repetition of notes. Mm -hmm. um, but like ambient's more like like furniture music, like once we like towards the background. Mm -hmm. It's not really supposed to stick out in any way. Yeah, okay. Who else? I see another hand up here. Yeah, Solomon. I don't know, I would say minimalism involves using as as few elements as possible to create something while ambient is not necessarily using a smaller number or a you know, a smaller volume of instruments or sound, but mm -hmm. um, but like you're saying, one it's meant to be in the background, it's not meant to have like prominent melodies or you know, even part of the anyway, yeah. Yeah, that's good. Minimalism can actually be part of the board. Okay. Casey. Um, it's also kind of just like pushing the definition of music and what elements you need to have in order to have a quote song, but like, there is a piece that's just the sound. Okay. I, I think the, the main thing that I'm hearing here, and I think that's good that I want to amplify, is attention, right? Ambient music, people that make ambient music uh, will tell you that they are not trying to create music for attentive listening, directive listening. They're trying to make music that can exist in the background while other activities are going on, okay? Whereas minimalism, I don't know, if you ask the kind of the, the, the big... Minimalist composers, Philip Glass, Steve Reich, Terry Riley, Lamont Young, maybe not, I don't know, yeah. There, there is still this idea that it's, it, there's a, it can exist in a concert setting and people go there and attend to the piece of music. They're listening to the piece of music, okay? So really, I think one of the major differences philosophically, okay, whether it happens in reality, I'm not quite sure, okay? Because I'm sure there are people that put on minimalist music and treat it as ambient music and just let it exist in the background. I'm sure there are people that go to concerts where an ambient piece is programmed and they give it attentive listening, okay? Uh, but philosophically, one of the key differences is whether you're creating music that's supposed, to, the intent is for it to just exist in the background while other activity is going on, okay? And by other activity, I mean everything from writing your term paper to doing yoga to, I don't know, what else? other things you could do while ambient, whatever other things you can imagine doing while ambient music is going on in the background, okay? Um, so that brings me to uh, the historical figure. Who is Brian Eno? Because his name is kind of like just dropped and then they kind of move on. But he's a composer of ambient music, right? Yes. Right. Yes. Okay. Composer of ambient music, okay. That's... He's also uh, done a lot of other things with art installations as well. Um, he has a piece that uses uh, generative um, visuals that I believe is called like one million paintings or nine million paintings or something like that because it's he literally figured out that it could generate millions of variations basically. Um, so he's also done some stuff with art installations as well, uh, both in light and painting and uh, in digital. Uh, let's see, like digital art basically. 
Uh, and he has another career, which is as a commercial music producer. So you may have heard his work working with bands such as U2, uh, Coldplay. Who else is he? Talking, Talking Heads. Yes, he's produced a lot of um, well-known and established acts throughout uh, from 1980 on, basically. Okay, uh, so you may know him in that regard. Uh, his connection to today's topic, ambient music, I mean, he's one of the first people to put out music and explicitly say, this is ambient music. This is music that is not meant for directed, attentive listening. It's meant to exist in the background. Just turn the volume down and do whatever you want to do. Relax, uh, work on reading, work on writing, those sorts of activities, okay? Um, and so he gets mentioned a lot as being kind of the father of ambient music, okay? Or, uh, but... There are other people that were attempting to do this. Uh, there's a mention of furniture music, right? And Eric Satie, okay? So Satie was talking about this idea of background music, things that are just meant to exist in the background. Uh, but he didn't use specifically that term ambient, okay? So when you think ambient and the, the coining of that term, applying it to music, that's Brian Eno, okay? Um, now, the piece that I was playing at the beginning when people were walking in, okay, that is uh, a specific famous uh, work related to ambient music, which is, did everybody catch the name? <coughs> music for airports, right? Okay. And the idea and the theory there is that, uh, the, the, the idea behind that name is that airports are these stressful places, okay, so what if we created ambient music that was less stressful that would lead to people being not so stressed out when they're in the airport, okay? That's the kind of, it's not that it was specifically commissioned by an airport to play as background music. It's, it's this kind of theoretical positing of what if we created music for, to make airports less stressful. Um, I can say from experience that if it's on your iPod and you're waiting in the airport, it's kind of nice to put on music for airports on your iPod while you're waiting for your connecting flight, basically, because I've, I've done that before. Uh, and it is kind of this ethereal space that's created as people are bustling by you. Uh, uh, get yourself a copy of Music for Airports if you travel by airplane quite a bit. Especially it's, through Atlanta. Especially through Atlanta, yes. It, yeah, Atlanta becomes less stressful with Music for Airports on your iPod. I can, I can vouch for that. Um, <clears throat> so, there's that. Now, how was... Music for airports created, okay? This is where generative concepts come into play and where it's going to connect to what I want to create in the, um, the session I want to launch in front of you guys, okay? Uh, some of the tracks there were created by having specific pitches, specific notes on tape loops, okay? But those tape loops, rather than being all synced up, rather than being... Uh, fractions of each other, they were loops that were not easily repeatable, okay? Uh, that is, they didn't synchronize with each other, they didn't come back around, they didn't create parts of the whole, uh, and so when you listen to them, they don't sound like tape loops, they sound like an ever-shifting melody, okay? What do I mean by this? Well, in uh, in one talk, he describes it here this way, okay? I'll, I'll read this real quick. Music for Airports, at least one of the pieces on there, which is track two, which is the one that I was playing at the beginning of class, is structurally very, very simple. There are sung notes sung by three women and myself. One of the notes repeats every 23 and a half seconds. It is, in fact, a long loop running around a series of tubular aluminum chairs in Connie Plank's studio, basically. When you have a 23 and a half second loop, tape loop, like literally tape, okay? It doesn't fit in the machine. You have to run it through the machine, and then hold it out physically in space, basically, in order to get it to create a loop that way, okay? Uh, the next lowest loop, every 27, uh, 25 and 7 eighths seconds, or something like that. The third one, every 29 and 15 16 seconds, or something like that. Uh, what I mean is that they all repeat in cycles that are called incommensurable, okay, which is a big word, okay? Uh, they're not likely to come back into sync once again. That's what he means by incommensurable, okay? Continuing on. So there's this piece moving along in time. Your experience of the piece, of course, is a movement in time there. So as the piece progresses, what you hear are the various clusterings and configurations of these six basic elements. The basic elements in that particular piece never change. It's these six notes that he's talking about, these six pitches. They stay the same, but the piece does not appear... Uh, the piece does appear to have quite a lot of variety, okay? Does everybody understand conceptually what he's talking about here? Yep. Tape loops that don't synchronize well with each other. That, okay, and, and in not synchronizing well with each other, we hear them as an evolving melody, okay? Do, do you, now that this is the process that went into 
creating that piece I was playing at the beginning. Okay. Did you hear it that way when I was playing it before class? No, right? What did you what was your experience listening to it? You heard Okay, you weren't paying attention because it was ambient, right? Yeah. Okay, good. Unfocused, good. Um, it just reminded me of a song that I've heard slowed down like a thousand times. Ah, okay. So really slow <clears throat> songs. Okay. It sounded intentionally varied. Yeah, it sounded intentionally varied, but it's it's very simple. It's these different pitches on different loops. Okay. So we're gonna experiment. What what I, one of the things I really like about live is it lets you do this. Okay. Um, all of the stuff we've been doing up until this point has been loops that are the same length. Okay, what we're going to play with today are loops that are different lengths. Okay, so if you're not on Blackboard, get on Blackboard and download uh, the session that I've got there under the class examples folder. Many of you have already downloaded it. You can go ahead and load it up. Um, but we're going to be playing around with that, and I'm going to be using this technique of different uh, length loops to bring to the fore generative techniques but also to bring to the fore different modulation synthesis techniques, which is going to be our topic for the rest of this week, modulation synthesis. Because until this point, right, we've been working with single oscillators, okay? Now we're going to actually start to combine those oscillators to get more complex timbres, okay? So those of you that have been bored with sine waves and square waves and triangle waves and sawtooth waves, get ready. I've, I've hyped, have I hyped this up enough? Are you guys pumped? Modulation synthesis? No? Yes? Okay. So we're going to be looking at these two instruments specifically, analog and operator. Okay. Uh, I need to break out of Keynote myself and get this loaded. Load up live. Okay. Again, it's in the class examples folder. You should be able to download it. It should be a zip file. Once you unzip it, it'll have the live set in there for you. Um, and I would recommend that one of the first things you do would be a save as, uh, particularly on these days that I'm pushing a live set to you and we're going to kind of play around with it. That way you've got the initial state saved so you can always come back to it if you screw something up in the middle of the demo. Okay, uh, But uh, by saving as, you can save all your uh, your your changes. Uh, and for me, it's just as simple as saying, uh, well, this is 9-12 start. This is... Um, you know, I'll put my initials or put your name or something basically there. You can save it right back in the project folder, and it basically is saving a different version of that live set inside of the project. Okay, so I'm inside my same project folder. I'm just saving it as, you know, my um, I'll say NW changes. Okay, so I'm going to save it back in there. Okay, now as I if I save along the way, I can I can make changes. Okay, so I've started off with a very simple clip here, which is four bars with an E3, okay? Everybody see that? Okay, so pay no attention to this track over here. I want, to, I want you to focus on the one that says parallel oscillators and this one clip that's an E3 playing for four bars, okay? If you, uh, if you are using headphones here, okay, because we're using raw synthesis, my recommendation is to turn down your volume before you get started, okay? Uh, just to make sure you don't blast out your ears, okay? Uh, so be careful with that. Or if you want to use the speakers inside it, it should work okay to have, because we have all nice consonant pitches that work together. So if we have all these machines generatively creating ambient music, it actually might sound really pleasing to have them all, all these computers running at the same time. So um, we're going to start on the parallel oscillators, which is running this analog. Whoa, that's too far. Let me zoom back out here, okay? which is running the analog instrument, okay? The analog instrument has two oscillators and they run in parallel. What do I mean by parallel? When, where have you heard that term parallel and what is maybe the opposite in terms of when you're configuring devices? They may have this come up before in say a, 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 a science class and uh, dealing with electronics. Parallel, the term parallel, when I say something is running in parallel. Same time, same settings. Same time, same settings? Okay. Not exactly what I'm looking for, but did anybody ever do like experiments with like light bulbs in, in science class in high school and you had the, the electronic devices in parallel versus in series or no? 
Yeah, same amount. Yeah, okay. So when you've got things running in parallel, when you're at light bulb, you've got the same amount of voltage going to everything, right? As opposed to when you put them in series, it's you're getting a little less voltage everywhere down the chain, right? Okay. So we can talk about uh, the sound producing of devices being in parallel with each other, and what's happening is their output is being mixed together, okay? We'll see this a little more obviously when we get to max on Wednesday, okay? But know that the two outputs are then being of these two oscillators are being mixed together and then being output to the speakers, okay? It's not that one is running into the other in series, okay? So that the output of oscillator A is going into output B, okay? We're gonna look at that on the next couple of tracks. These are two oscillators in parallel, so we're gonna hear them independent of each other, but when we mix the two outputs together, we'll actually hear some interaction of their sound, okay? So in this interface, you'll see right here, the oscillator is yellow, okay? That means it's on, so this yellow button right here turns the oscillator on and off okay but just like our when we talked about the synthy and the euro rack okay it needs to be amplified before we can hear it okay so they've kind of taken a nod from hardware synthesis and this is what we were kind of working with here at the beginning of class and i was trying to remember what was going on you need to actually turn on the amplifier over here before we can hear this e3 okay so go ahead and turn on the amplifier and if you play the session now, you should start to hear. And every three, every four bars, it's rearticulating the attack. Okay, is this working on everybody's machine? You've got the oscillator on again, and you've got the again, again, you have the oscillator on, and you have the amplifier on. Okay. Ah, somebody has already spotted the detune knob. Okay. So the first thing I want you to do before we get to detune, we're going to get there in a minute, okay? So if I now turn on the second oscillator, okay, these two oscillators, one and two, are now going to this single amplifier here and being output to my speakers, okay? We're hearing both of them, but over my speakers here, it still sounds like one. Why? Yeah, they're the same pitch, they're in phase, they're doing exactly the same thing. So our ears can't differentiate them because they're exactly the same, okay? That's where detune comes in. So now if you grab, now that you've got two oscillators on going to one amplifier, grab the detune on one and just nudge it a little bit. Okay. What's happening here? Some cool stuff, okay. Some of you are saying cool stuff and some of you are like, ah, make it stop. Okay, why, why is that? Yeah, they're slightly different now, okay. And so that pulsing that you're hearing is actually the difference between those two oscillators, okay. And in fact, we can predict the rate of the pulse because the pulse is always going to be the difference between the two of them, okay. Those of you that are, that are wind players that have to uh, tune up in an ensemble, right? What happens as you start to get closer and closer in tune? The sound becomes flat, right? You start, you hear those beats, and it stops, right? When you lock in, when you're in tune, okay? What we're doing here is effectively the opposite. We're taking two oscillators and then we're detuning one to create those beats, okay? Because, quite frankly, one of the things that is interesting in electronic music is to, is to go the opposite direction, to detune things intentionally so you create variety so that not everything is exactly the same digitally perfect, okay? So detuning things is, is a, strat a, a key strategy in creating electronic music timbres, okay? So now, they're together, so if everybody could stop for a minute so I can hear just this one up here, just for one minute, okay? So right now I've got my two oscillators at okay and it's going very slowly because it's the difference between the two the difference between the two is going to be 0.02 actually I don't, I don't know that this is hertz here so I can't predict that but if I detune it even more here it starts to throb more okay okay 
Now I want to show you one other strategy, and this is why I had you guys stop for a second because it'll only work if I have two sound sources. If I turn on the second amplifier, now, now each oscillator is going to an independent amplifier. And when they're going to independent amplifiers, I can one, apply a different envelope to each one, but two, what I'm primarily interested in is I can pan one left and pan one right. So now, now the detuning is not happening in the speaker, it's happening in the air. I'm back up, I pan one left and one right. I've got two, uh, two different oscillators going to two different speakers and the detuning is happening in the air rather than on the speaker, okay? To convince you of this, let me, let's see. Oh, something's wrong. I shouldn't be hearing that pulse. Wow, okay. Well, if I turn one off, interesting, okay. I should not be hearing the pulse. So this is uh, a little less clean than it should be because if I do this in max, I can pan between the two speakers and you'll hear a steady tone and then you'll hear a steady tone between the two basically. That's what I was trying to achieve. So they're a little more mixed than I thought they were. Oh, I'm getting nothing over here. Oh, because I turned it off. Yeah, but if I've panned one left and one right, I should be hearing one on one side and one on the other side. So, oh, yeah. see what I'm saying? I point this out because you can actually create some effects where it feels like the sound is closer to you because there's a difference between the two speakers. It only works over speakers. It doesn't work over headphones. If over headphones, your ears will basically just say, what's going on, basically. You get some differences. This is the binaural beats phenomenon. If you've seen some of there's there's kind of some... Uh, some chatter about that on the web, basically, about creating binaural beats between your two ears, okay? That's what I was trying to create here, but obviously some mixing is happening somewhere, and I don't have time to resolve that here, okay? Right, everybody get what I'm saying conceptually? Even though my demo is busted and it's not working. Sorry. I shouldn't have tested this over headphones, because you can't, you can't hear that over headphones. Uh, okay. In addition to this detuning factor, we also have an LFO here, okay? So if you turn on the LFO, okay, turn on LFO 1, and if you turn up this hertz, let's see, I think you might need to turn off one oscillator. No? Okay, guys, where's my... <laughs> Well, that should be affecting the volume, and it was last night when I did that. I love it when a plan comes together. Okay, moving on, because my LFO is not working. This should be creating a kind of warbling effect like this. Okay, I'll manually LFO here, okay? My manual LFO, okay? It should be doing that, but it's not. Yeah. It modulates, yeah, in this particular instrument, it modulates the amplitude, the volume. What now? What does LFO stand for? LFO stands for Low Frequency Oscillator, okay? It's the same thing as an oscillator, it's just modulating at a low frequency, okay? It should not be, according to the documentation, it's supposed to be modulating the volume. Okay, so moving on. Okay, so two oscillate. That's our two oscillators in parallel. So go ahead and stop the clip. Okay, take the clip, drag it over to the next one because the next one we're going to get into ring modulation. Okay, in ring modulation you have one constant oscillator and then you multiply the output of that oscillator with some other signal. Okay, it could be another oscillator, but it can also be an acoustic signal, 
Okay, so it's multiplying an, off, an oscillator by another acoustic signal, whether that be an oscillator or another one. Okay, we're going to deal with one oscillator, or we're going to deal with oscillator and oscillator today. Uh, when we get to max on Monday, I'll actually, we'll connect up the microphones and you'll hear what happens when you ring modulate your voice. Okay, it's kind of cool. Um, so, we've got ring modulation here. I'm using the, anal uh, the analog, excuse me, no, the operator instrument this time. Okay, so it's a different in instrument. If you go ahead and cue this clip, you'll hear it sounds sort of similar to the other one, yes? Okay, this is why I was saying, those of you that started this up early, please don't mess around with the instrument settings because I set them all intentionally at the starting point to be exactly the same starting point, okay? So in the operator instrument, we have actually four oscillators. A, B, C, D, okay? That's what their letters are. I'll zoom in a little. Well, I don't want to zoom in anymore because I don't want to lose part of the screen here, okay? So A, B, C, D. Right now you can see that A and B are on because they're lit up. The ones the C and D are gray. They're not on, okay? So leave it that way. Um, you can actually configure these oscillators in different ways. This little tiny inconspicuous uh, green, red, yellow, blue. It looks kind of like the Microsoft Windows logo, right? Okay. If you click there, it actually shows you how these oscillators are configured. Okay. So these options at the top are the configuration of oscillators, and you can have them completely in series, or two in parallel, then going into series, or this way, or that way. Right now I've got it in this two by two configuration, okay, so that B is feeding into A, okay, or green is feeding into yellow. Everybody see that right there? Okay, so the output of B is going into A. We're now connecting these oscillators in series so that we can create modulation synthesis, okay? So in this case, I've got B set up to be fixed. Everybody see that this fixed check mark is checked, okay? If I now take the level, and this is where it gets a little unintuitive, to create frequency effects when you're doing modulation synthesis, you have to start with the level of the oscillator, not the frequency of the oscillator. So starting with the level, if you start to turn this up slowly over time, you should hear the timbre start to change. Right hear that? Is that happening on everybody's computer? Okay. You are now ring modulating that initial E from the synthesizer, okay? Okay, now those of you that have, does anybody in here have perfect pitch? What happened to the E? Do you hear an E anymore? No. No, right, okay. So the thing you have to keep in mind with ring modulation and a lot of these modulation synthesis examples is you will very quickly move away from controlled pitch, okay? But what's happening is the frequency of my oscillator that's set to E is being modulated by 10 hertz at a very high depth, basically. And I'll show this a little bit. This will become clearer as you start to do uh, readings. What I wanted to do today is get the sounds in your ear of these different types of modulation synthesis. Okay. So now that you've increased the level, now grab the frequency knob and start to move it. Okay. So how would you describe this using words? <laughs> sci-fi, sci okay, yeah. There's a lot of classic sci-fi sound synthesis in modulation synthesis, okay? A lot of classic sci-fi sound design cues are developed using modulation synthesis, okay? Whether on hardware or on, on software, okay? Uh, the early days would have been hardware, okay? But you can start to hear...
and you can hear how if you start to even it, it gets more extreme the higher the frequency right because you're actually modulating that pitch really rapidly okay but you can also change the timbre and kind of dampen that effect by if I lower the level I go back to my sine wave Ever hear that if I leave the frequency up but turn my amp my level down I go back to my original sine wave. Okay? Yeah, question. So the root is still E, right? The root is still E, yes. Like no matter, um, it's still there, and the way to hear it is to turn the level down on the modulating oscillator. Um, like right now, no matter what frequency you're setting to, it's still E. Like yeah, but because it's modulating so rapidly, if I turn this back up, uh, I can hear a little bit of the E in there. E in there, yeah. Maybe hearing someone else's. Okay. Okay, so that's ring modulation. Okay, we've got one oscillator modulating the pitch of another. Okay. So go ahead and if you're playing along at your seat, go ahead and stop the cue so it'll die away and drag the clip over to the amplitude modulation track, okay? This is the same instrument in Ableton, okay? This is still the operator instrument, okay? But what we're doing now with these two oscillators, I don't know, well, let me let you guys look at it. Do you see, if you click between the ring modulation and the amplitude modulation, look at these two oscillators and what do you notice that's different there? No, no, here. Just click between the two. So, yeah. Everybody see that fixed knob is not set? Okay. Look right here. And if I slip over to amplitude modulation, okay. My second oscillator is no longer fixed, okay. It's not playing a fixed frequency, okay. What's happening now is that both oscillators are going to track with the pitch information coming in via MIDI, but they're going to track in um, a relationship with each other using the coarse and the fine knob, okay? So if you go ahead and cue the click again, again, it should sound like a sine wave, but if you come down here to your operator instrument and start to change the coarse and the fine knob, Oh, I have to turn up, always start by turning up the level. Okay. This is where you gotta be careful with your headphones because it's gonna get, you got a lot of high frequency content out of these right off the bat. Using this configuration, it should be easier to hear the pitch maintained because now it's it's still following the pitch. Okay, they're both locked into the frequency that's being generated by the MIDI pitch. Okay, but by not having one of the oscillators fixed, it's still the same configuration. And if you need to convince yourself of that, look at the configuration. See, I've still got it in this configuration here. Okay, but by not having one fixed, we get a different effect. Okay. Um, and this is maybe where we want to uh, break with using the same, uh, let's see, how should we do it? Uh, I'm going to turn off the clip, and if you, I'm going to just quickly, if I go over to the MIDI track, on the MIDI track I've actually got the rat patch, the, the rat uh, patch from the, um, let me see, can I drag this over to the amplitude modulation track? Look at that, lovely, okay, and so if I turn on the rat patch from the book, I can start to hear what this sounds like across the piano spectrum here. Yeah. Yep. You have to enable Java in order for Max to live to do it. That means basically means that your computer has not used Max for live yet, so you need to enable it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Lovely. So I've got. 
Okay. Now, one thing I, I, I did give you one modification of the uh, rat patch because the rat patch plays random pitches across the entire uh, 127 pitch range, basically. It's maybe a little bit more useful to do that within a random range that's a little more narrow. And so what I've done here, I made a slight modification of the patch and that rather than generate random with an argument, somebody asked about arguments, right? An argument is nothing more than the initial setting of an object, okay? So random 24 basically means I need you, I, I want to set that argument for the range of the random to 24 rather than 128, okay? And then I'm going to add in a 60, which is middle C on the keyboard, okay? And so it's going to generate two octaves of random atonal trash rather than uh, eight, eight, what is it, uh, divided by 12, 128 divided by 12 is over two, like 12 octaves of random atonal trash, okay? Roughly. Make sense? So I've limited the range here on this version of it. So if I pull this into my patch, my amplitude modulation, and turn it on, it's all in that two octaves right around middle C. Now this is not very ambient because of the speed, yes? We want to move slower with an ambient patch. But I've also got my tempo set to 180 up here, yes? Okay, so if you wanted to play around with this, you could uh, lower the tempo and start to get slower changes of atonal, cha of atonal change, right? Uh, but then again, atonal music is not usually uh, very ambient, yeah, shall we say? Is that a fair assessment? Those that are, okay. Uh, in atonal music, we're not just playing the white keys on the keyboard, we're playing the white and the black keys in a random pattern, basically, okay? Uh, and, and it's harder to kind of latch on to the tonality of the thing uh, using that, okay? So amplitude modulation. Let's go to frequency modulation then. So I'm going to take this clip, drag it to the next bar here. Okay, and if I look at my, again, it's operator, but instead of, the configuration is the same, the difference here is what I'm connecting the velocity to, okay, I'm connecting to, uh, the, it, to the frequency change, and so I get a little bit different configuration here uh, when I make the connection to uh, frequency in the second one rather than amplitude in the second one and so now when I play that E this should start to sound a little bit different if I turn this level up here I get even more I get even more complex spectra basically by playing with it this way because I'm mod instead of modulating the the volume the amplitude in the in the first in the third track I'm now modulating the the pitch the frequency okay and so I get broader spectra even than I had the first time okay uh, and again we're gonna if this is getting a little complicated uh, you're reading tonight and you're reading for Friday we'll reiterate this stuff give you some more uh, ex explanation what I'm trying to do today is get these in your ear okay. How does this connect back to Eno, okay? Because that's where I started the class, right? Well, if you look on the, and maybe I don't want this, okay? So I'm gonna spend the rest of the time just kind of improvising with this, this set, okay? On this MIDI track, which has no instrument on it, okay? I've got a series of MIDI clips, okay? Uh, and what I've done here, you notice that I put the pitch, but I also put uh, the length of the clip in my name that helps me see how long it is and I'm using decimal notation here but the point one here is not it's not one tenth okay it's one beat okay so 7.1 is seven bars and one beat 8.2 is eight bars and two beats eight bars and one beat okay everybody see that here right here so I've just used, I'm just using that notation as an easy way for me to see how many bars and beats the length of that loop is, okay? And you'll notice that uh, those of you that are uh, into music theory, we've got some, what hopefully should create some pleasing intervals here. So if you start to drag these to the different tracks and hit play, I don't want another E4, I don't want, I want, um, oh wait, undo, undo.
Yeah, I don't like the tamer on that one. I'm going to turn that down. Okay. So I've just got the A, the B, and the E playing on my different tracks here. Maybe I'll take the uh, the E3 is going to be a lower note, so maybe I'll... Oh, actually, I know I've got a different variation. I'll hit the 4 plus 4.2. I'll wait. And so all I'm doing is I'm taking my MIDI clips that are different lengths, and I'm dragging them to my different tracks, okay? Uh, once you get used to these instruments, you can also now start to play with the timbre of each track, right? Yeah, I don't like that. Let me go down Okay. In addition to driving it with this source material of different length loops, okay, I've also set up the send and receive. That's something I mentioned before and I was going to get a little more in depth to, but I don't think I can do it in 30 seconds. But an inline effect is only on that channel, right? But I can also use a side chain effect, a send and receive, to affect multiple channels, okay? So I'll, I'll have to explain this in a little more detail in a future class, but Right now, if you take this send A, it's going to go over to this channel over here where I've got a ping pong delay set up, okay? So if you start to turn this up, oh, and then I have to turn this on. much out of this. Well, I don't know why here. There it is. Over here, the delay that's on there now. Congratulations, I just cre you just created your first generative ambient piece using Ableton Live, okay? Any questions? Well, yeah. Okay. I had fun playing with this last night and putting this together because it I, I kind of got into it and jamming with it. I didn't get as far as I'd like to, but uh, as you're packing up, just a reminder, there are actually a few, quite a few things happening this, uh, this week in the evening if you're looking for uh, cultural credit events. Uh, one that I'm on the committee for, there's somebody talking about, uh, at the, there's a lecture that we bring in annually on American Jewish culture. Uh, she's, Hasia Dean is going to be talking about food and American Jewish culture, which if you're interested in that, you can hear that Tuesday night. Uh, we also have Satoshi Takeish, uh, and I think it auto-corrected there, sorry. Uh, who's going to be on Friday night over at the Second Stage Theater performing. Uh, Matt Roberts will be doing interactive visuals with him, but he's going to be doing a live uh, kind of combo, combo there. Uh, do work on your readings for this week because it will fill in a lot of the gaps of the theory of this modulation synthesis, okay? I'll talk to you guys later.